Hello and a very warm welcome to today's Cisco chat. My name is Hazel Burton and today's broadcast is all about helping you to defend against critical threats. So I'll be interviewing six experts from across Cisco Secure and we'll be chatting about what we saw in the threat landscape in 2021, what we're seeing now, and we'll be using those findings to talk about how defenders like yourself can best protect your organizations in the months to come. Now, speaking of 2021, last week on Twitter, we asked you to summarize the year in the threat landscape in GIF format. We had a lot of responses and I've done my best to summarize the general feeling amongst you all. So this is Malcolm Reynolds from uh, the epic Firefly series, cancelled before its time, uh, being thoroughly confused and disheartened at the same time. Captain America here with the, uh, I think the intonation is, here we go again. There were lots of gifts with a general air of sadness and tears, uh, summed up here by Jake from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And everything's on fire. <laughs> that was quite a popular one. My favourite, though, actually came from one of our panellists, Jerry from Kenna Security. And it's uh, this one. And it summarises how many of you as defenders have been feeling about the past year, or probably more than that. There's a lot going on. Uh, gas not being available in the United States due to a cyber attack, log for a J uh, wreaking havoc before the holidays, the most prolific year for CVEs that we've ever seen, um, and I've not even mentioned ransomware yet. So we empathise. Um, the people on this panel know only too well what it's been like. Um, so we're here to help dive through the data and work out what we can learn from that that is going to help us all moving forward. So coming up on today's show, first up, we have Matt only. Uh, Matt is the director of Talos Intelligence and Interdiction, um, and he's going to be talking us through uh, the aforementioned colonial pipeline attack um, and how we entered a new era of um, critical infrastructure security. Matt's also going to be talking about the evolution of ransomware and supply chain attacks. Then Dave Lewis, one of our advisory CISOs, is going to be talking about a topic that he is immensely uh, passionate about, and that is security debt and why that is becoming increasingly critical. Then we have Jerry, Jerry Gamblin from uh, Kenner Security, now part of Cisco. Uh, Jerry is going to cover the top vulnerabilities that you may or may not have heard about. Um, after that, we have Liz. Uh, Liz is our practice lead from our TALUS incident response team, and Liz is going to cover Log4j. So what happened, where we are now, but also how you can defend yourself in the future from zero day attacks. Our penultimate presenter is Atiyom Holup. Um, Atiyom is going to, uh, Atiyom's from, uh, sorry, Cisco Umbrella, and he's going to be telling the tale of Emotet and its roller coaster of a year. And last but absolutely not least is um, Ashley. Uh, Ashley is one of our threat hunters and she is going to be covering a topic that has been a little bit niche up until recently. And that is the, uh, the rise of Mac OS malware. Okay, so I'll be keeping an eye on any questions that you have for our team coming in. You can uh, just ask your questions in the comments of uh, whichever channel you are watching us on, or if you're watching us on Cisco TV, just pop your question into the uh, Q&A box that's there for you. Um, you. We're doing this at the end, um, I, I some questions at the end, but if you have a burning question for our panel, um, get them in as soon as possible. Right, first up, Matt. Now, we are going to be talking about Colonial Pipeline and ransomware, Matt, but we have you here today. Uh, I can't not ask you about Ukraine. What is the latest? What's happening at the moment? Um, well, Pervit, Hazel, uh, hello. Um, the uh, Ukraine, right now, um, uh, they're in a, in a kind of stone recovery mode from, from attacks over the weekend. Um, there were there were kind of two very close uh, to each other. One was a defacement attack against about 80 government websites uh, that included some language in Polish, in poorly translated Polish, uh, trying to kind of antagonize the relationship between Ukraine and Poland. Um, and the second, which which happened shortly after that event, was um, a set of uh, Ukraine government institutions experienced uh, some wiper events inside of their networks. 
so we've uh, we've published on that. Um, I think we are, are up to date uh, right now at, at blog.talosintelligence.com. Um, uh, the Ukraine CERT just published something that's roughly in line uh, with what we wrote, I believe. Um, and so uh, we continue to monitor, continue to work with our partners there in Ukraine to, to try to secure a, uh, a peaceful operating environment uh, for the people of Ukraine. And we hope uh, that things settle down quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and everyone just do keep an eye on the Talos blog for any more updates. Um, but Matt, if you can talk uh, generally about the Talos Threat Intelligence and in Interdiction team, um, what does uh, that team do within Talos? So we do a few things. One, we provide support to the Cisco Talos Incident Response Team so that um, if they have intelligence needs, uh, we're there to support them or if they have customers who are asking questions that we can support, um, we, we work through them. Um, we also manage the national security and law enforcement uh, relationships globally between um, Talos and, uh, and and those organizations. So it's under under that role that we've been working with, with elements of the Ukrainian government to help them uh, recover from those attacks. Um, and uh, we also do critical infrastructure research um, uh, into uh, uh, various ways that critical infrastructure can improve um, and secure its environment so that those utilities and additional capabilities that, that governments need to, to support their people are always available. Brilliant, thank you. Um, now, when we talked last year, there's obviously quite a few threats that you could have chosen to talk about today. Why did you choose um, a Colonial Pipeline? What is significant about that that attack? So there's there's two things that I found kind of interesting about Colonial Pipeline. One was uh, the the real world impact of Colonial and what happened uh, to supplies uh, on the East Coast of the United States and, and how that applied political pressure and how that subsequently led to, to a, a, an increase in, in speed in terms of, of response from the U.S. government on ransomware activities. And on the flip side, um, the reaction from the bad guys on this event, um, uh, it was very much an, an Icarus-like uh, mm. and they, they, they knew that they had, they had overstepped, uh, and there was an immediate and profound response from, from that environment. Um, yeah, I had to step that back. Perfect. So walk us back, um, a little bit, tell us what happened from a timeline perspective. When did the ransomware attack start and the initial response to that? So I want to be real clear up front that, that that Cisco wasn't involved in the response. So all of my information is from public reporting. So we're not we're not kind of disclosing any customer details or anything like that. But but back in um, in early May on a Friday, very early in the morning, a um, uh, previously infected network at Colonial then went to encrypted, um, uh, where they lost their essentially the entirety of their IT network, um, and so. Critical infrastructure environments like this are typically broken up into IT, um, which are the environments that you are most familiar with, and then OT, the operational technologies environment, where are the where the industrial pieces live and the things that drive the pipeline and pump the gas and monitor all of that. So their OT in, environment was reportedly unimpacted. Their IT environment was impacted. They very quickly um, paid the ransom of 75 Bitcoin, which on the date uh, was roughly four point four million dollars, um, and and found that the tool provided by the actor was to to do the decryption was so slow that it was still faster for them to recover through traditional means. So they they I don't think they would would say that they got value out of their their payment there. Um, what's interesting about about this is the impact that it had. So so re there are reports that that because Colonial was unable to track the gas and bill because that capability was in their enterprise environment. Um, they chose not to pump gas, even though the OT network was was up and available. Um, to be to be clear, from from Colonial side, there was also you know some amount of concern about ensuring that the OT network was secure, and so so there was there was that concern. But they very quickly shut off pipeline operations, like within an hour of the encryption event, um, they had stopped pumping gas, and so for six days they didn't pump gas at all uh, to the east coast, and so they they're responsible for like forty five percent of 
um, the East Coast's um, fuel, and that's not just like gasoline for your cars or, or petrol. Um, it's also natural gas. It's aviation fuel. There's all kinds of different products that they they supply, or the base for those products that they supply to different different environments. Um, as as you know, kind of looking back, um, the response on the East Coast was largely panic buying. Um, as, as stations began to run out of gas, uh, there was hoarding, which which made the situation worse. There were some unfortunate incidents of people trying to like fill up uh, non uh, non standard containers with gasoline. Um, there was eventually a government kind of notification that you should not put gas in plastic bags, which is definitely a bad call. Um, and so this impact kind of went for a while. And so even after they restored operations, and I think that was on the, the following Wednesday, so that was on the 12th of May, um, six days after the event, six days after that, there were still um, over 10,000 gas stations on the East Coast without gasoline. And so um, you get a, a kind of indication internally that there was increasing political pressure on the Biden administration because of this. There was concerns that it looked like the 70s gas crisis um and and that it that it that it if it had gone on too much longer and estimates kind of vary but like from three to four days it would have started to have a broader economic impact um impacting starting at like mass transit and then kind of spreading out as people would be unable to get to jobs etc so there was a very real concern about what what a longer term impact would have been here um so that's that's the event itself yeah and then on the attacker side, you mentioned the the Icarus factor flying too close to the sun. Um, what do we know about the bad actor side of this attack? There's there's a few kind of data points there. Like first, like immediately, um, there was chatter um, on on underground forums and the dark web, etc. Um, that this was this was a mistake, uh, and so there was actually very quickly. Uh, you you started to hear from various ransomware groups where they would actually lay out formal policy where they're like, this group does not attack critical infrastructure or hospitals. Um, or or you saw um, various underground forums put in rules that you may not, you know, advertise ransomware services here because they're trying to avoid the law enforcement um, uh, attention that comes from being associated with ransomware. And this this hasn't gone away, like in terms of like inside of their memory. So recently, the Russian government arrested um, some number of members of the Our Evil ransomware gang, uh, which were which were involved in another event, JVS Meets, which which was also uh, pretty impactful. Um, but the first response that we saw was very interesting. What is the what is the underground kind of discussion about this? And the first response was was a statement like they had nothing to do with the pipeline. Um, and so people people in that that on that side of things understand that this changed the calculus for countries and how they treat ransomware actors. And so so I was on the ransomware task force that actually delivered its findings a couple of weeks before Colonial happened, I think. Um, and one of our one of our pieces of advice was to treat ransomware as a national security issue because it had it had cropped up in this way. And so. Um, as part of this, the Biden administration accelerated some executive orders. They come out. Um, you saw an increase in activity from uh, U.S. Cyber Command. You saw uh, the FBI actually recovered some of the funds um, through still not completely understood means. Um, unfortunately, they recovered like 80 percent of the Bitcoin, but it, by the point they recovered it, Bitcoin had crashed. So it was only like two million, two point two million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, but but yeah, the the. The bad guys know that this was was a bridge too far for certain. Mm -hmm. um, you gave a quote um, in an article just after the attack, and it was along the lines of it's time to move beyond ransomware thoughts and prayers. Why yeah. did you say that? Well, so. Basically, what, what, what a lot of government response um, up until this point had been about information sharing um, and kind of getting the message out and stuff like that. Um, and then relying on traditional law enforcement methodologies to go after these actors, uh, even though, you know, it's been pretty clear that that was not not a viable path for the most part in terms of what we see in terms of impact versus a pretty poor record in terms of arrests. Um, and so what 
I've always, you know, separately, I've said that, that information sharing is also the thoughts and prayers of cybersecurity response. And that that is, it is something that you can point to that needs to be done. It always could be better, but it doesn't, you can't measure it in terms of how it helps. So, mm -hmm. and, and then ultimately you could be delivering information to someone who just wasn't in a position to act on it. And so what we're saying is, is the ransomware threat continues to be um, at the level for certain actors that you need to treat them as national security threats, which means you need to bring in the full scope of government response. You need the State Department, you need Treasury, you need Cyber Command, you need Department of Justice, and whatever those equivalents are across the globe, because this is a global issue, even though I'm kind of calling out US-centric uh, government institutions. So so it it no longer can be solely the province of, of um, kind of bulletins and notifications and the occasional law enforcement investigation that dead ends somewhere in Eastern Europe. Brilliant. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the the Art Evil group um, and their involvement in uh, the supply chain at attack in July. I think it was a July 4th weekend whilst everyone was uh, logging off for the for long weekend. Um, what can you tell us about the nature of ransomware and supply chain attacks such as what we saw in 21? Going into this year, what do you think we might might be seeing? So, like in terms of Kaseya, um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, it certainly was a change in behavior for ransomware. We've always been concerned about um, the breadth uh, that a supply chain attack could bring, and so we saw what a ransomware like event could be when delivered through supply train uh, in 2017 with the NotPetya attack, which caused over $10 billion in damages globally. But to be very clear, that was a purely destructive state-sponsored attack, not ransomware, but it was intended to look like ransomware. Yeah. Um, so um, in in this case, in Kaseya, you know, supply chain is the hardest problem in security right now i there's i, I can't think of, of anything else that is that is as, as flummoxing as as that um and so the actor found a way found a weakness um to kind of get inside of kaseya and then to in kaseya delivers services to to mid-sized companies uh to give them administration services for their networks and their systems which is exactly what you want as an attacker um, and so this represented, you know, a new level of threat. I'm not going to say it's a common level of threat. It's difficult to pull off because you, you, while you are attacking multiple companies simultaneously, you still need to deliver different versions of software or different sets of keys to each of those environments so that if one pays and gets a key, that key doesn't unencrypt everything. And so there's a management overhead that kind of slows this down, which is one of the reasons I think that we haven't seen this more commonly. Um, and also they're making plenty of money in the one by one method that they're doing now. Okay. And just very quickly before I bring Dave up, um, what is your advice for defenders out there trying to protect against attacks such as these? Um, so pay attention is like is like my new main advice. Like there's it's there's been an evolution of advice. We've always said patch, we've always said two factor authentication. Um, but in working with um, and I think Liz would back me on this, in working with CTIR and kind of watching um, how actors are getting in, et cetera. In the terms of ransomware, there's a lot, not a lot of moment to moment evolution in their practices. Uh, it's rare for us to get a ransomware thing where we're like, oh, well, that's new or that's different. Um, and so if you are paying very close attention and you are mapping your investments and your time to, to, blocking the avenues that ransomware actors use in terms of stolen credentials and specific vulnerabilities, um, you're going to do very well in, in staying ahead of those actors because they don't care who they hit. They're just trying to kind of keep that 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 chuck wagon going. So so if you're better than everybody else and you're more difficult target, they're going to leave you alone while they go after easier prey. Great advice. Thank you, Matt. Um, and you can read more about the new world of critical infrastructure security in uh, Talis's article about Colonial Pipeline. Our team is um, popping the link to the article in the comment section of all of our channels at the moment. So you can, uh, if you haven't read it already, uh, you can check that out. Uh, but in the meantime, Dave, can I bring you up to talk about security debt? Can
Really? Excellent. So what is security debt and why is it becoming increasingly critical? So security debt is a term that I started using um, probably about 15, 20 years ago uh, as a result of my time that I spent in critical infrastructure working for various power companies. And I found that in a lot of those environments, they were using systems that were in a lot of cases deprecated or were not being properly maintained. And as a result, there were all sorts of targets of opportunity for an attacker. Now, the way I characterize it, it is the technological debt that has manifested as a security issue, either by you know, virtue of time or neglect or you know, simply an interaction with another system that's been introduced into the environment. Brilliant. And, you know, during all of your time um, running security at various organizations, is there an example um, that you could potentially point to um, that illustrates um, what security debt looks like in situ? I, th this is the problem that I've been laboring under since we first talked about this, is that there are many different examples I can pull <laughs> from, but one of the really simple ones was for a tech company I was working for quite a long time ago, where we, in the first week I was on the job, we did an assessment of all the usernames and passwords within the organization. We found that there were 10 user accounts that had super user status within the organization um, that were belonging to people who were no longer a part of the organization, as in they had left. And one of those people, unfortunately, had passed away in the last five years, and their account had been used in the last two years. And if we had not gone through and done an audit of all of this, nobody would have actually noticed this had been done. Um, and it, we were very lucky in that that particular account was not used for anything malicious. But luck is not a policy that you want to you know, hang your security program on. So making sure, like very much to what Matt was talking about, you want to make sure that you're aware. You want to make sure that you have that visibility to, to see what's happening within your environment. Absolutely. So... Walk me through from an attacker point of view, how how could they exploit security debt within an organization? How would they potentially go about it? Well, for a lot of organizations, it becomes a case of low-hanging fruit. Um, there are vulnerabilities that are not patched either because they just don't have the bench strength within their organization or they don't have you know a trusted third party that they can be working with. And as a result, things get pushed off or you have projects that are deployed within an environment that don't have a sunset provision built into the project plan. As a result, some of these projects limp on years past their useful life and, and unfortunately introduce security vulnerabilities into the environment as a result. So the attacker can look at it from many different ways. Obviously, there's the likes of Shodan, there's scanning, or there's something as simple as just open source intelligence, like going through LinkedIn and seeing what people put in their resumes that they worked on this product and that product, and they can actually distill down the products that were possibly used in that particular environment. And then compare and contrast against vulnerabilities that are either published or you know they can find on the dark web. They can then build up a profile of that particular organization and target it. So bearing that in mind, what is your advice to the organizations listening um, who might have security debt that they know needs to be addressed? What would you say to them in terms of the best way to go about that? Well, it's threefold. First, you have to do your homework to that. Know what are the assets within your environment? Who are the users in your environment? What are the applications and the hardware? So you want to go through and have these inventories available to you so you know what it is that you're trying to protect. Then you want to be able to go through and have a risk register to be able to track issues as they are identified. Now, this is not only for you to help you know, make sure you're going through to track it to end of job, but also be able to deal with your auditors when they come calling and say, look, this is the issue we've identified. This is the plan that we have in place. So it makes it a little less painful when you're dealing with the uh, auditors uh, that you can actually demonstrate that you have a roadmap to get to end of job. And the big piece of the puzzle uh, that I always love to pull out is define repeatable processes. I have worked in organizations in the past where when something went wrong, everybody ran around with their hair on fire trying to figure out who had to do what. You want to make sure that you have a process in place that you are going through and you can identify who are the people within your call chain you have to call when something goes wrong. Who has what task to take care of? And don't tag it to an individual by name, tag it to a role because people come and go through it in an organization and you know that's just the way it is. So you wanna make sure that the role is identified so that when something does go sideways, that you have a path to help remediate that. Yeah. 
And I guess that repeatable process that you mentioned being built in, is that going to help the issue of security debt potentially reoccurring? Because I imagine it's a bit of a, uh, a cycle sometimes. And yes, and that is very, very true. So if you have that process in place, when you introduce a new application in the environment, you have a sunset provision that's built in as an example, so that this application doesn't live on past its useful life. In one organization I was working at, we had an application that had gone horribly awry. And when we tried to reach out to the owner of that particular application, we couldn't clearly identify it because it wasn't properly documented. So as we went through and tried to figure things out, I did a rather rash thing and I just went and I pulled the ethernet cable on it and I tied a note to it. Not a path I recommend for anybody else, but that was back in the day when I thought I could get away with these things. Eventually the, pro the project owner came running screaming bloody murder that you know his application was offline and he needed to have it up. It was a SEV1 incident. I said, all right, come with me. We walked out onto the raised floor and I went over to the rack and I said, is this your server? And he goes, yes, turn it back on, da, 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 da. I said, okay, well, first there's a note attached to the ethernet cable for you. He opened the envelope, looked at it, read it and said, thank you for your time and walked off the floor. That system had actually been offline for nine months before anybody noticed. So it's things like that, where if you have a defined repeatable process, you make sure that you're able to identify these sort of issues so that they don't happen in your environment. Are you running systems that don't have to be there? Do you have cats running through your data center? You know, you want to make sure that you don't have these weird little problems that are going to crop up. Sorry, Matt, I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, there's there's current, currently a cat running across Matt's test. Don't know if he took out an Ethernet cable, but <laughs> hopefully not. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a, I guess it's a case of, as you say, not having to face that decision when it comes to managing the risk, building those processes in preemptively so that security debt doesn't be be the one thing that attackers go after. Yeah, when you're deploying systems in your environment, it's the, not the Ron Popeil method of set it and forget it. You have to do care and feeding for all of these systems because problems are going to crop up either by virtue of a vulnerability being found in a particular library or a particular package that you're running or by virtue of the fact that it's interacting with a system that has been introduced to the environment that then causes a knock-on effect. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. Anything else that you want to, to, to say before I bring Jerry up to talk about vulnerabilities? Well, when you're looking at uh, you know, security debt within your organization, you have to realize this plays very much into what Matt was talking about a little earlier in that it impacts your supply chain and the supply chain, not just in the physical sense, but in the software sense as well. If you have applications that are being built out by third parties, um, you want to make sure that they're following a, uh, a defined repeatable process that is not going to introduce uh, vulnerabilities into your environment you know, by happenstance. I've lived through that in organizations in the past where vulnerabilities were introduced, not out of any sense of malice, but because nobody was actually checking the libraries to ensure that the code was up to snuff. Um, you want to make sure that you're looking at your environment and say, okay, well, are these systems the ones we need or can we just do a forklift replacement of these particular bits of hardware, which while it would improve you know, the latency of your devices, you can also be obviating a lot of security issues that may have been there before. And you also want to make sure you're approaching things in a way of democratizing security because you know many countries around the world are still dealing with a hybrid workforce and will be for the foreseeable future. So you want to make sure that you're empowering your end users so that they can get their jobs done safely and securely. And we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that's not making it more difficult for them. We don't want to expect them to be using tools written by engineers for engineers. We want to make sure that we're giving them stuff that is easy to use, but safe and secure. And you can look at uh, examples of what we've seen with the uh, trusted access report that we put out this past year, as well as the uh, security outcome study that was put out, where there's a lot of great data as to how organizations have approached this. Uh, the security outcome study, as an example, uh, was a double blind study. So this was very, very interesting interesting piece of work to look at because it's all about reducing the risk in your organization and you want to make sure that you have a clear understanding what that expectation of loss is in your environment. But I'll leave that to Jerry to talk about that a little bit more. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, the um, the report, uh, the Trusted Access Report by Duo and the Security Outcomes Study, um, those will be available to you in the comments section of the channel that you are watching on very, very shortly. Uh, do check them out for all of their advice about tackling security debt. Um, thank you, Dave. Jerry, can I bring you up now?
um, and we're going to talk about the top vulnerabilities that our audience may or may not um, have heard about. So can you tell us about the work that you do uh, within your team to scope for these vulnerabilities? technical and balanced budget, because this is what leads to the technical debt that that Dave just just talks about. It. It's the breadth of vulnerabilities that we're seeing uh, every year. Uh, this year, I think we saw over 20,000 CVEs for the first time. If you, if you flip to the next slide, we have that kind of kind of laid out. Yeah, the, the number this year was 20,129, right? That's 55 CVEs a day. Um, I don't know many security teams that are staffed to a level to be able to look at 55 CVEs a day and understand, you know, which ones are important, which ones aren't important. And, and then the old adage of we're just going to patch everything that's CVSS 7 and above, you know, the, the, the problem with that is we're now sitting at an average CVSS score of 7.1, right? So if you're on that train, you're already saying they're just going to patch half of all the CVEs that come out. Uh, and it's not getting any better. Uh, using the profit framework from Facebook, we, we run a model every night and it looks like there's gonna be over 23,000 CVEs this year um, was the latest prediction there. Um, we know for sure that, that this, this is a problem that is just growing bigger. We don't like to say worse because CVEs are valid. We're not saying that there aren't valid CVEs, but there's more reporting. GitHub is a, a big CNA now that they pushed out the most CVEs last year on open source projects. So we're seeing more and more in that, that area. Uh, and the truth is, is that while we're talking about, about vulnerabilities that are really popular, that everybody knows about Log4j, along with with the exchange vulnerability that was early this year, we're seeing more and more vulnerabilities come through on Chrome and Edge in, in huge waves. And, you know, Print Nightmare was one of the most impactful vulnerabilities that, that we're not going to talk about in depth this year, just because of how widespread it was. And, and to go back to what Dave was talking about, how much of an impact it made on operations, because at the end, Microsoft kind of ended up giving up on Print Nightmare and set it back to where you had to be an admin to install printers. So it really, really kind of changed the dynamic on how those security teams work in, in that arena. Definitely. Um, vulnerability disclosures aren't often um, headline grabbing news, um, but certainly should uh, be getting more attention than they are currently. Can you can you talk us through why that should be? Yeah. and. The intention is, is trying to figure out how you balance talking to your board about uh, one of the CVEs that come out or to your management about a CVE that is more impactful on your network than something that, that hit the Wall Street Journal, right? Um, there were probably a bunch of organizations that don't run Java that were lightly affected by Log4j that, that had their executive looking at that and say, hey, what can we do? What what resources can we give you for Log4j that, that they didn't need, but they don't get to ask that question in a wide manner, right? Like, hey, what, what can we give you in patch management to make your life easier, right? Just because it's not getting that same media attention and that media exposure, but it doesn't mean that that risk individually for that organization is, is at a lower level. And we need to, to work with with organizations to understand that out of these 20,000 CVEs, you might have some that, that get a lot of media attention, but you're much more likely to have the most impactful ones miss that media wave of attention. Definitely. So what occupied your team's time during 2021? Can you highlight some of the top vulnerabilities? Yeah, we spent a lot of time on, on the Chrome V8 engine, which they're rewriting. Um, Microsoft made a big uh, change this year when they moved from Internet Explorer, which was the bane of everybody who worked in IT in the early 2000s, to now it's based off Chromium. So we're, we're really working on making sure our customers understand the, the switch from an open source browser from a closed source browser. Uh, we also see a lot of virtualization vulnerabilities becoming more and more common. Um, we saw a lot of VMware vulnerabilities this year that we hadn't seen in the past. 
And, and we're starting to see the, the emergence of what we like to call internally pylon CVEs. We really don't have a good term for it yet, but you'll see you saw it in Lock 4J, you saw it in Print Nightmare. A base CVE will come out, and then in, over the next couple of weeks, you'll see, oh, I looked at this code now because it was interesting, and I found this CVE and this CVE and this CVE. I think that at the end of the day, there were six or seven uh, print print nightmare CVEs, and I think there are three or four unique log 4J CVEs of, of really once the media turns their attention onto a class of vulnerabilities, it, it starts to get a lot more attention. Brilliant. Well, as a marketer, I'll try and come up with a a, a name for you that's uh, better than Pylons <laughs> CVEs. Uh, that's on the do list. list. Um, okay, so what did the what did these findings and activities that happened in 2021 tell you about what defenders might have to face this year? Are there any vulnerability trends that um, you can point to? And I know you just released a brand new report this week, which highlights some of those. Yeah, we we know that. There are a lot of vulnerabilities out there, and over our data set, 95% of assets has a, have at least one exploitable vulnerability sitting on there, right? Um, and that we know that CVSS isn't a great predictor of exploit exploitability. Um, we're not saying anything that CVSS themselves don't doesn't say, right? We made some news that says Twitter is a better, you know, is a better indicator of exploitability this week, but. But we know that what you have to look for isn't in the CVSS score a lot. So you really need to move to a risk-based vulnerability management system where you're looking at, hey, is this a remote code execution? Is there released exploit code for it? That's probably the biggest thing that, that you can do. And you know, what can we do to make sure that the vulnerabilities on our network are are, you know, are in line and are are being addressed properly? Brilliant. Okay. So um for our defenders who are listening. What is your best practice advice that will help them? And I know this is a, a phrase that you you like to use, gain back the advantage when it comes to uh, vulnerabilities. Never turn off automated patching. I, I spent uh, some some early time in, in IT too, in both the government and in private industry and go back and have those fights. Everybody always wants to turn, turn automatic patching off because they don't know what it's gonna break. Uh, if you leave it on, you're much more covered, right? So, so if at all possible, leave on your automated patching and let it take care of the small stuff. That, that'll give you time to, to really dig in to the vulnerabilities that you have to spend a lot of time and effort and testing on patching. Brilliant. I know you and the team um, do an awful lot of work to make sure that all of this information gets out to the public. So where can, where can people check out the resources that you are um, putting out there about these vulnerabilities? Uh, blog.kinosecurity.com has the P2P report, and I have a personal project that runs a notebook every day at uh, cve.icu that kind of just does some open source uh, data analysis on the CVE data set that, that's pretty useful. Brilliant. Uh, yes, we will put the direct link to the pri prioritization to prediction report um, into the comments of the channel that you're listening on. So um, it is a fantastic report. Definitely encourage people to to check that out. Um, thank you very much, Jerry, for sharing all of your insights with us. Um, Liz, thank you. Liz, time for some log for a J. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just quickly, so we've reached the halfway mark. Um, if you have just joined us, you're very welcome. And we're ans answering your live questions um, at the end of this broadcast. So get them in um, at, at when you can. Um, just mention, mention us at Cisco Secure or drop your question into the comments. Right, Liz, Rob for a J. Um, before we get to, to that, tell me about um, your team. What does the Talos Incident Response Team do and how does it help our customers? Um, I think the too long don't read version is we are Cisco's, Cisco's customer facing incident response team. So we are helping our customers find out if they have been compromised and then help them through, you know, figure out how that happened and then guide them through how to, you know, get things back up and running. Uh, we work very, we are part of Talos and we work very closely with Matt's team, the threat to intelligence and interdiction team. So we can bring all of their intelligence and then all of Cisco's products and manpower to help address, um, you know, incident response. Excellent. Okay, so can you take us through how did the events of Log4j 
unfold um, at the end of last year. So um, we start off in this timeline, it says December 9th, but really obviously this was ha- things were happening before December 9th. Uh, we know that on November 24th that the Alibaba cloud security team um, basically you know, alerted Apache that there was a remote code execution vulnerability in RCE in their Java logging library. Um, and this will come into play later, but so right now, I mean, at that point, there's at least 1800 unique code, code libraries and projects that are integrated into cloud services and endpoints that have this logging, uh, this logging library in them. So the amount of exposure is we, once this hit the, hit the papers, we knew this was going to be really big, um. Really, so jumping forward to that December 9th, this was really when things started going public about this. The first patch was released by Apache, and then we started seeing exploits and things popping up. You know, Minecraft users were like, oh no, my my code is going to be, you know, affecting my Minecraft game, which, you know, with things that people really care about. But um, we as Cisco Talos on December 10th started the Talos blog, um, the Wit Live on that day. And we're basically watching to see what is happening and doing what I kind of call the new vulnerability dance, right? Because just like our customers, we're also being hit with a fire hose of information. So we're trying to figure out what's going on, how do we respond? Um, And then obviously, you know, the vulnerabilities and exploits change as we go through this. So we're trying to figure out and keep up with that news of, you know, I think uh, Log4J had three vulnerable uh, three patches that came out before December 18th so that you know is always meaning like okay we've got to make sure you patched once but it's not you know not done now it's kind of like with COVID right you got your first vaccine now you got to go get your booster all right now you may need another booster okay so really kind of going through that mindset of going back and forth with it um but then you know we as incident responders as customer facer facing incident response team it was kind of quiet we expected, really expected over the holidays to like start getting slammed like we were the year before with solar winds. And it was just kind of eerie. And we're like, oh no, what's happening, right? So what's happening while it's quiet on the customer side is that people are out there developing exploits. And so really we started seeing the uptick of like the major exploits starting um, this month in January. On January 5th, uh, UK's National Health Service, NHS, reported that they were seeing uh, vulnerabilities in their VM uh, in VM VMware Horizon servers being exploited. Uh, so what does this mean? Um, so according to Huntress, there are about 25,000 Horizon servers that are currently internet ac- accessible globally. Um, and that's according to Shodan. Um, also, according to Huntress, uh, you know, they within that data set, a large number was in patch. And I'm sure the people at Kenna um, who are really happy to have a part of our Cisco family now so we can work to to help these other customers uh, would would echo that sentiment, right? That is, this is huge. A lot of people are using VMware Horizon. What does this mean for them, right? So really, the, I think that bottom line is once a vulnerability comes out, we start being exploited and then we have to adjust our techniques. Yeah, absolutely. So as of time of recording, um, January 26th, what is the situation right now with Log4j? So like I said, the v- right now the situation is the main exploit we are seeing is the VMware Horizon. That is the one that us and other people within the industry are noting an uptick of that being exploited. However, you know, there are still a number of things that are going on, um, things like, you know, even just things that affect you personally, right? So as I was reviewing, like, okay, what are the new exploits? I'm like, oh, hey, my router is something that is vulnerable to this. Has my home router been updated to, you know, be secure against this? And so it's just something that you have to keep in mind that log for, you know, this application is in a lot of things, right? So we are still uh, being very diligent in how we're monitoring the world and dark web and making sure that we can respond as effectively as possible. Brilliant. Um, I want to talk about um, some incident response trends that your team um, published this week. Um, So Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities, the ones from early spring, were, um, according to this new report, um, it was the most impactful event for Cisco Talos incident response customers, comprising 35% of all incidents. So could you talk about that in terms of what were the lessons learned um, from that scenario that you may have applied to something like Log4j? So with 
the Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities, really the we developed what we call a plan of action. And we started doing this with SolarWinds. So we actually, we're always learning from what's going on, what are our past responses doing and how do we apply that to the future? Um, so we developed this plan of action for SolarWinds or like, what do we need to know to for ourselves as responders? And also what are our customers going to be asking? So kind of broke it down into um, like about seven sections. And the first thing we really want to know is, you know, what is the background? What is the threat overview? And this seems like a very simple thing, but like I said, there's a fire hose of information coming out. So my incident response team, and then also just my customers, they need a single source of truth to go through. So for us, it's going to be, you know, something like a plan of action or the Talos, you know, the Talos blog. We want to have one place where everybody can go to and say, this is the latest, this is what we know. It's a living, breathing document, and hopefully not breathing, because that would be weird. But, you know, it's an, an, an always like updating document, right? And so even if updates are slowing down, we know like, okay, we're going to have to go back and probably fix more of this information letter later. Uh, the second thing we want to think about are just the threat capabilities, right? And so this is going to help an organization determine its risk. You know what, and I think kind of you know, echoing back to what was said earlier is you know what what's really important to us, right? You know, do we need to worry about the CVE? And with this one, he's like, yeah, yeah, you need to worry about this one. Um, but really thinking about like, okay, so I know if they get this, they can get a control of the system. What can they do with that? Oh, they can, you know. They can go uh, move, you know, move laterally, they can steal data, they can deploy ransomware. Like, so we pretty much have a pretty broad spectrum of capabilities once this threat has been activated. But we want to make sure that we're prepared to help our forensics team if this goes further down a compromise path within the customer. Um, then obviously the most, you know, the probably the biggest question that we get asked when these things come out is how do I know if I am vulnerable? And I'm not going to lecture anybody about a good threat vulnerability management program. You know this, everybody knows this, um, but it's still that's something we're seeing done well at a lot of our customers, right? And there are a lot of resources out for them to do that. Um, and I think where it becomes really important for things like Log4j, the first thing we're going to ask you is, have you looked at your software inventory? Have you looked at your inventory of systems to know what is running Log4j? And so we're like, hey, look at that list. And you're like, well, I haven't built that yet. That was on, you know, I have that in for Q3. You're like, well, guess what? You're doing that now. Um, so highly recommend that you do these things ahead of time so that you can be able to answer these questions a little better. Um, then, of course, with Log4j, it's not just your things that could be that are going to be affected. It's going to be your vendors and your partners, right? And so this is why we all started breathing into paper bags when this exploit came out because you're like, oh god, the these the landscape for this is is pretty big. Um, but you know what we will do is we will you know, basically track down you know what kind of documentation is there for what what is affected, right? And there are a number of resources out there that we can have quick references for our team to kind of run through a list. Like, do you have these things? These are things that you could be vulnerable for. Um, and then, of course, I think the next logical question that everybody has after that is, was I exploited, right? So if you answer to you know the first question, am I vulnerable? Is yes. Then you go to the next one and did somebody actually use this um, for, you know, log4j, you know, there's some things that are going to be very generic that we're going to do across multiple incidents, right? Uh, we want to look at perimeter security you know, devices to see if there's any presence, uh, presence, <laughs> presence of IOCs, right? Um, or, you know, have we seen any signs of lateral movement? Look at your web server logs or related IOCs, those type of things. But we want to kind of keep that running checklist so that we're not missing anything as we're thinking about how this could affect our customers. Um, and of course, with our own documentation since we're Cisco, we also are documenting how our products can be leveraged, uh, not only in terms of preventing, but also what can we use for detection. For example, if we uh, if a customer has secure um, secure network analytics, we can use that to look at their NetFlow and figure out what's going on within that. Um, so after you go through all that, and then we, we really want to think about mitigations, right? Because everyone's going to want to know if the answer to the first one was yes. Um, oh, well, how do I fix this? Uh, for a log for J, it would be, hey, why? let's disable the JMDI, the Java naming directory. Um, and that was something that was disabled in the latest patch of log for J. So it goes into, hey, did you upgrade to this patch, right? 
Uh, then we also want to make sure that we're tracking down what other what other mitigations that can be, because inevitably I'm going to go to a customer and say, you need to update this, whatever this application is to this. And someone will say, I can't do that because it's going to break Karen's accounting payroll and she she needs us for this. So like, all right, we need to figure out some mitigation, some workarounds that they can do that, you know, to have that second answer available. Um, and then, of course, you know, what if I was vulnerable and exploited? And at that point, we say, you know, activate your IR plan and call us or work with your other incident response providers in order to do that. Um, the last two parts that we really think about making sure are updated for our team are IOCs. This for an incident responder, this is our gold. This is what we want to be looking at when we go into a customer's environment to see if there's any signs of vulnerability or exploitation. And obviously, these things that list is going to keep growing. And uh, we also want to make sure that we are documenting all the wonderful things that the industry is putting together. And so we have basically just created a library of all the articles that are out there about this so people have a place to go. Perfect. And yes, that article that Liz mentioned, the living, hopefully not breathing, hopefully not sentient, <laughs> um, that is, um, that as Lynn mentioned, that is always going to have the latest information. So you can bookmark that. That is cs.co slash Talos log 4J. Uh, and again, that link will be winging its way to you shortly. Um, Liz, with your crystal ball, and I know you have one, uh, I know you have three. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think log 4J might make an impact this year um, based on what we have seen so far? I, it's going to be, an, it's, just, it's just going to be an impact, right? Um, I think one of the things that we're concerned about responders is that this can be a very stealthy way into an environment. So being able to determine initial access, which frankly is always a challenge for us um, and not, a, you know, if, if, I'm not saying it's a challenge for us to find it. It's a challenge because people aren't logging effectively or, you know, basically keeping track of what's happening in their environment. Um, so really, I think for us, it's going to be, hey, we want to come in before we get to that post-exploitation part, right? So hopefully people are, you know, following the advice and patching and things, but also monitoring for other signs of things where you may not have caught it, right? Am I seeing signs of, you know, lateral movement in my environment? Am I seeing, you know, just in general, you know, things that are indicators that your environment was compromised? So um, it's only January, what day is it? January 26th. Um, so we already have VMware Horizon that's just just started. And I think, you know, we're going to be seeing that for a while. Okay, and um, you covered um, some fantastic advice around, you know, if a new exploit comes along, such as Log4j, what teams should be doing. Is there anything else that you would like to say about potential new zero days on the horizon? Um, I think, you know, Dave said he was talking about care and feeding. I think this is really important for this during incident response as well, because the first information that you're going to get is not going to be the last. So right now we're going through and we're updating our plan of action with the new, you know, the new indicators that we have, the new ways we're seeing it exploited. So making sure that you have that information documented. And sometimes it's silly things that we learn, like as we're going through, um, looking through the horizon thing, uh, there is a legit utility within that named non-sucking service manager. And so all every time, like the first comes up and everyone's like, oh, this is clearly something by an adversary. And you're like, no, no, that is, that's the name of that actual utility. So just having that information will actually save you a lot of time. So, cause every, if we didn't have that written out, every time somebody went and saw a non-sucking service manager, they would just be like, clearly this is an adversary and not, not something legitimate, right? Well, uh, I don't know if the camera is on my face. When you <laughs> said that, but I hopefully summed up the audience's <laughs> um, feedback at that name. Um, that's a takeaway. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, Liz. Um, so, we, yeah, we have the Talos Threat Advisory constantly being updated with the latest information. Um, and do be sure to check out the Incident Response um, Trends, uh, checking out their blog. And we have a URL for that too, which is cs.co forward slash 2021 TAR, um, a really, really great read. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, Atiyom, if I can bring you up next, and uh, we're going to cover the gift that keeps on giving, uh, which is Emotet. So can you give us uh, a bit of a history um, about this? And it's been around in various different guises. Um, can you give um, a history of its impact in the threat landscape and how it became a widely distributed threat? 
Definitely. If we try to predict the future, we have to learn from the past. So with Imotet, as you mentioned, has quite a history. Uh, first appeared in 2015 is pretty straightforward banking Trojan. It's many of them been around. However, it had a very strong developer team behind it. So it was evolving as it was going. So in 2016, it was first reconfigured as a loader. And then in 2017, we start seeing it being offered as a, a loader as a service model. So when it got a uh, strong cooperation with malware like TrickBot and QuackBot, that's where the most success came to it. In 2018, it became the most prolific uh, year for Imotet and the triad of uh, Imotet, TrickBot and Ryuk ransomware with uh, multiple high profile attacks. To name the few, uh, they were able to pound the entire city of Frankfurt, one of the biggest financial centers uh, in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, Allen Town, the city in Pennsylvania, was crippled by Imotet infection as well, as well as the biggest uh, state court uh, in Berlin. And uh, if we go to the next slide and uh, we'll look at the infographic uh, of the Imotet, we can see that at the start of, 2000, uh, of 2019, we were blocking up to 4 million requests a month for uh, Imotet and the collateral malware. So that speaks to the volume that it's able to pump out and uh, the successful uh, amount of infections it was able to achieve in a relatively short period of time. So following that, in uh, 2020, uh, we've uh, seen some periods of inactivity because we as defenders and the, as a security industry uh, learned very well and start uh, multiple groups were created to uh, kind of like organize cooperative effort to tackle down the Imotet. So it uh, effectiveness went down. However, malicious actors having such a powerful business solution uh, don't want just, you know, go away. So we've seen several periods of inactivity, which resulted in uh, Imotet coming back stronger than ever with uh, uh, both refactored code and the new ways to deliver it uh, payload uh, to the uh, malicious, uh, to the enterprises at scale. As I've mentioned, they became one of the first uh, big uh, loaders that were able to get the access to enterprise networks, uh, both in private and uh, government sectors. Okay, so we're up to the year uh, 2021. What did we see there? I know there's a couple of things that you wanted to cover. Um, should we start um, the the uh, the earliest um, activity in 2021? Do you want to talk about what happened there? Correct. So in January, uh, in a collaboration of both private and uh, uh, public sector, uh, as well as uh, operation led by Europol and Eurojust, uh, we were able to uh, disrupt the operations of uh, Imotet. Uh, we were able to take down a giant part of the infrastructure. And uh, once again, both public and private sector all across Europe and North America collaborated with authorities to take control of the infrastructure. And uh, this control resulted uh, in uh, a few months later, I believe it was April, where Imotet malware was uninstalled from uh, all of the infected devices that we were able to get uh, uh, C2s of. Also, uh, there was uh, another successful operation uh, by the uh, cybercrime unit uh, of uh, Ukraine. They were able to arrest several gang members uh, who are uh, believed to be uh, developers behind the Imotet, as well as uh, a few other people in uh, Europe. And uh, at that time, we hope that, you know, uh, it, it's gone for good. Unfortunately, uh, that's not what happened. No, it, just like the Godfather, just to, just when it was out, they pulled it back in. Um, so how did Imotet um, come back from the dead uh, towards the end of 2021? Well, unfortunately, due to the nature of the operations and the profit this malware was able to generate for a cybercrime community, at the end of the last year, we've seen the resurgence of the Imotet. Uh, it has a, a rebuilt infrastructure and now it keeps expanding. Once again, we see uh, uh, it, it's not a coincidence. It is caused by the major shifts in the overall cybercrime domain. 
the growing monopolization of the ransomware world, which is, uh, you know, rapidly conquered by only few highly organized criminal uh, corporations, uh, leads to better opportunities for criminal ventures like Emotet botnet developers. So the new criminal alliance between Trigbot uh, that we've seen around uh, for a long time, Emotet, and now Conti is a logical avenue for the criminals. And now we know that Conti is very highly targeted. They only go, uh, you know, to very uh, high profile targets to maximize their revenue. And now if they uh, really will go this exclusive way of being distributed by the uh, duet of Trigbot and Emotet, uh, I'm afraid that uh, uh, will be rampant in the upcoming year. Yeah, could you talk a little bit more about that? You know, based on what we've seen, and um, you know, could you could you offer some some of your best predictions about how um, Emotet might manifest itself in 2022? Well, I honestly believe that it can become the biggest threat of 2022 just by knowing how much uh, this triad changed the entire modus operandi of not just uh, them but uh, all other ransomware operators. We've seen it with, uh, you know, uh, using the supply chain attacks as the entry level. However, having this powerful loader coming back to life, once again, getting the initial foothold in the systems, uh, being able to uh, build very strong profiles of the affected networks, being able to uh, deploy uh, things like Trigbot and the Cobalt Strike, which is a very powerful tool for lateral movement and taking over the entire networks. And now having Conti, a very highly organized ransomware in at their arsenal, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we will see uh, quite a few of the high profile attacks involving this particular kill chain uh, this year. So bearing that in mind, what is your advice for the defenders listening and how they can protect their organizations from this type of attack? Well, as uh, you know, with anything in the security and uh, with such complex attacks like Emotet, there is not a single solution which can completely stop these attacks. In my opinion, the key to prevent infection incidents is a complex approach uh, where you want to uh, use a layered approach to the security. Apply security controls at uh, any weak link within your network. You have to know your network. You have to know where those weak links might be, and you have to apply security controls there. And as an analyst myself, uh, you know, for other analysts, uh, I'm always recommend to focus defense strategy on detecting lateral movement and data exfiltration to the internet. Pay special attention to the outgoing traffic to detect cyber criminal connections, and always, you know, know your threat intelligence. Have your threat intelligence at your dispose use the latest um, information to stay aware of actual TTPs used by threat actors because their tools, their uh, operations might change, but their procedures uh, always follow uh, the path that they were successful before. And that uh, aspect of their cybercrime operations is rarely changed significantly very fast. they quite slow to adopt it, and you have to know what's being changed to be able to battle it. Great, thank you for uh, thank you, Artem, Art for um, for sharing all of that. Um, for more on this and other topics, um, Cisco Umbrella has a report. It's called "The Modern Cybersecurity Landscape: Scaling for Threats in Motion," and that is a fantastic read. And we will pop the link to that report in the comment section where you're watching. Uh, now, this is our last topic that we're about to cover. Um, so if you haven't got your questions in for our panel yet, now is the time to do so. Um, you can just add your uh, question in the comments of the channel that you're listening in. Or um, if you're watching us on Cisco TV, um, just pop your question into the Q&A box. Um, Ashley, welcome. Why would you like to talk about the rise of Mac OS malware? Yeah, uh, well, selfishly, this is my own uh, area of research interest, so I'm always uh, looking for an opportunity to talk more about this, uh, but also because I think that for too long, uh, we have been operating uh, under the assumption that macOS is impervious to malware, not really for any specific reason, uh, but just because this is a stereotype that exists and has been perpetuated uh, for as long as Mac has been around. 
I, I think that this increasingly is becoming an attack surface where we should focus resources. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to quantify. I think uh, how much of the overall uh, attack service uh, within a specific organization or even within the world is active Mac OS. Uh, but some numbers estimate this is probably around 100 million users. Uh, Microsoft is estimating about 400 million Windows 10 users recently. This obviously doesn't represent uh, all of the legacy. Uh, Microsoft products or Windows versions that are still being used. Uh, however, this is a pretty significant number. Uh, and I think that no matter what numbers we're looking at, uh, we can agree and, and much reporting lately does agree that the percentage of market share that Microsoft and, and Windows operating systems uh, covers is decreasing as we see the rise of Mac OS and other operating systems as well. So although maybe in the past this was not as attractive uh, of an attack service as it is now. Increasingly, this is a really great spot for uh, attackers to look to uh, target systems. Definitely. Um, you're going to share um, an example of this uh, shortly. Um, before we get to that, um, so you're part of this threat hunting team and your team is actively hunting for threats on the endpoint. What are you seeing at the moment generally in the threat landscape on endpoints? Yeah, to, so to give some background about what my team is and what we do, uh, a lot of talk has happened about the fire hose of information that we receive as security researchers, uh, and it is my team's job uh, to actually dig through that fire hose of information uh, and to identify any changes uh, in attacker behavior uh, that we can in order to hunt for new and emerging threats. Uh, in terms of, of trends in the overall threat landscape, we're seeing a lot of um, kind of the, the same things that we've been seeing for long periods of times. We see often that attackers are masquerading as legitimate uh, programs or, or uh, pieces of software in order to try and uh, hide or conceal their activity. Uh, we are also seeing though that continually uh, as attackers become more sophisticated and are being blocked uh, with some of the more traditional or more simplistic methods that they are seeking to really diversify the ways that they are targeting systems. And so increasingly we are seeing malware that's either targeting specifically Mac OS uh, or actually has the capability to target multiple operating systems uh, and will still be able to execute uh, and compromise the system, whether it's Linux, uh, Windows or Mac OS. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Um, so let's um, look at a case study um, that you have been um, exploring and working on. Can you take us through this in terms of what happened um, and the work that you did to uh, discover this? Yeah, so let me talk you through what it looks like kind of a day in the life of the, the threat hunting team. Uh, so what we are looking for on my team is changes in attacker behavior uh, that might allow us to identify new malware families or any uh, updates to existing malware families so that we can proactively protect our customers. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, on my team, we monitor a lot of um, behavior that goes along with malware. We actively track the actor groups that are behind this malware uh, and we, we have a handle on their methodologies. And so when that methodology changes, uh, that sets off alarm bells for my team. We're always curious why things are changing and, and to what end would they be changing. And so uh, we actually identified uh, that an existing uh, dropper technique, the ways that an attacker uh, in this particular group, a, a malware actor, uh, is looking to get the initial binary on a system before exploitation. So we saw this change in behavior uh, and we went ahead and grabbed all of the the malicious files we could that were associated with this campaign and then ripped them apart. Uh, and, and this was interesting to us because although uh, this particular binary had the capability to exfiltrate some sensitive information from the systems that it was compromising, we actually did not see those capabilities being leveraged. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this is called McSnip because this uh, malicious binary was impersonating a screenshot tool uh, that you would download directly from this website rather than from the actual legitimate app store. So we, we see these malicious binaries, we see that we have the capability here uh, to exfiltrate some sensitive data and to uh, move laterally throughout a system, uh, but we don't see these capabilities actually being used. So we developed hunts for this, we're actively monitoring the situation. My team always likes to ensure that we're not seeing uh, active campaigns, uh, and we then saw the, the actual attempts to, to compromise systems die down. Uh, we later saw uh, in November, the other organizations began to detect this as well. And so that confirmed, you know, it's not just us that's seeing this. Other people are seeing this activity as well. Uh, and 
around the same time frame actually saw the, the secondary campaign where uh, some small updates to this malware uh, revealed that it actually was leveraging uh, the malicious capabilities for data exfiltration and, and other things. And so what we think that we've seen here is that initial testing stage where they're really the attacker behind this malware is really looking to ensure that yes, the, the dropping mechanism is able to uh, go as planned, that they're able to drop binaries on targeted devices, uh, that they're actually able to execute in the way that they intend uh, before actually uh, kicking off a, a campaign and, and looking to, to compromise systems actively. Uh, we're actually still seeing this uh, being leveraged or attempting to be leveraged against um, uh, customers in the wild, uh, but because of our active hunting uh, efforts and the, the work that we do on my team, uh, we're able to block um, actual execution of these malicious files. Brilliant. Um, and then from a defender uh, perspective, do you have any advice that you might be able to share with us um, in terms of how they can best protect their endpoints um, moving forwards from here? Yeah, I, I think there's been a, a lot of good thought, and in particular, RDM is also speaking from the analyst perspective, where uh, if you are actively monitoring the methods by which actors are looking to compromise and the ways that those are changing, uh, you have to really know what is being done to be able to protect from it. And so uh, ensuring that you have a good understanding of your attack surface as a whole, uh, that may involve doing something like a threat modeling and ensuring that you're communicating across multiple teams, uh, that you really understand where you're vulnerable. Um, as has been mentioned before, you know, ensuring that you are uh, patching and, and keeping things updated. But also, uh, in terms of endpoint, even doing these active hunting exercises where you're ensuring that uh, you're not just relying on, on what is known, that you're also looking for the unknown, uh, really helping to fill in any potential gaps. Brilliant. All right. Thank you very much, Ashley, for sharing all of that. Um, now it is time for our audience um, Q&A. There is still a little bit of time to get your questions in um, directly to us now. Um, do we still have Dave? Because I know, Dave, you've got to go on for um, a presentation in a few minutes. Are you still there? Because I have one for you. I am still here. Excellent. So we've got an organization. Uh, this question came in on Cisco TV, an organization small organization on a budget uh, and wants to invest more in security but um, doesn't know where to start what would be your advice well the, as i was saying when i was talking earlier uh, first and foremost you want to do your homework before you talk to any vendor you want to understand what the assets are in your environment that you are trying to protect you know what is your intellectual property what is it that's going to hurt the most if you lose control of it uh, once you have a firm grasp on that, you know, seeking out you know, companies like Cisco to build up a you know trusted partnership to help you, you know, work through that. Because as a small outfit, you will probably don't have the bench strength to be able to accomplish these ends. And this is where you know groups like Talos, groups like you know uh, various parts of the organization here can absolutely help. And we have all sorts of resources that are freely available on our websites as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. Um... A question for Matt, I think, and it's it's quite a big one. Um, where do you see the next 12 months going in terms of the threat landscape? That is from Kurt on Twitter. Um, I think you were mentioning this at the end of your section about um, supply chain attacks. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, you know, I, I, I think we'll continue to see, you know, there'll be one major scary out of nowhere vulnerability like is about what we're averaging a year um you know you had half vm last year and, and log 4j at the end of the year i think we'll continue to see those and i think i think companies will will get more used to that kind of race condition that you get into between adversaries and and like the emerging understanding of these new vulnerabilities um uh, we'll probably see some supply chain stuff. I'm very concerned about what we're seeing in Ukraine um, and and what what a, an escalation militarily there will mean in cyberspace and various um, collateral damage scenarios like we saw with NotPetya uh, in 2017. Um, but I, I guess I'm old enough now to where the years start to kind of look similar. There's definitely a difference. You know, there's definitely like a post ransomware and pre ransomware, and there's definitely, you know, sort of like a, a an era where even the security industry was less mature than it is now. So there's kind of those, but broadly speaking, over the last five years, 
Um, there's nothing, nothing that happened that fundamentally changed the way that we approach the market from a threat perspective. Um, you saw in the last five years kind of a real push on two-factor authentication that I continue to, to kind of lead with because it's a low-cost, high-impact uh, kind of security control for a lot of things. So I don't anticipate us being surprised this year. Um, probably definitely anticipate us being dismayed a couple of times. Um, but I think uh, what we're going to see is, is a continuation um, in different garb uh, of what we've seen in the past few years. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, Ashley, I think this um, is a, que a question potentially for you to answer because it relates to Endpoint. Um, uh, Wouter, who is, uh, I know Wouter, good morning. Um, he's watching us on Cisco.com. Um, any thoughts on the use of containers or techniques by malware to avoid Endpoint security products? Is it something which we'll see more of? And if it's a real threat, how should we defend ourselves? Yeah, I think attackers are always looking for ways to subvert detection, and that's kind of the name of, of the game in defense. Um, as techniques become known and become commonplace, uh, we, of course, see uh, them increasingly being defended against. And then when that is no longer a successful methodology for someone to compromise a targeted system, uh, they'll shift and pivot. And, and really, they're looking to innovate as much as we're looking to innovate as defenders. Uh, it, that is one of the, the reasons that my team exists and why we are actively uh, hunting for these types of methods where uh, attackers are, are looking to um, kind of avoid detection methodologies. And so, um, you know, in terms of recommendations, uh, ensuring that you are using quality security products where the uh, security teams are really looking to actively uh, innovate and ensure that protections are as up to date as possible. That's really the, the best recommendation I can give. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, thanks for your question, Valta, and congratulations on your Cisco Cybersecurity Defender of the Year Award. Um, that was awesome to see. Um, Liz, um, actually, this might be a question that I can cover as well, but it's uh, in reference to what you covered in your Log4j um, section uh, from Ahmad on LinkedIn. Can we have the customer checklist that was mentioned? Um, so when you're kind of running through all of the um, things that customers should check for when it comes to uh, zero day. We're, so we're going to be doing a lot with this recording. Um, we are going to making sure that you have this in blog format, in PDF format, in video format. So stay, stay tuned over the next few days and weeks because we will have all of that information um, coming to you. But Liz, is there anything else that you wanted to add about that uh, customer checklist um, when it comes to zero days? Um, I think, you know, as an organization, you know, you should be developing, you know, your playbooks, right? So uh, we always say, you know, start off with that IRP, IRP um, incident response plan, and then break that into sections. So I would just recommend that you just kind of have that template ready to go. In terms of what we're doing, um, obviously, that log4j blog would actually serve as your, your first checklist, right? So develop your checklist from that. Um, and certainly uh, look for the blogs coming out. And we'll make sure that we get, you know, those things detailed out. Perfect. Thank you, Liz. Um, I have one here um, from John on LinkedIn, and I think uh, Matt and maybe Ashley as well, you might want to come in on this. Uh, what skills should I be looking for when building a threat hunting team? So I would like to start, Matt. I've given up on trying to like build in my mind um, what a threat hunter is. Um, it's a bad habit, um, and I think when Ashley tells you a bit about her background, you'll understand why. The the core pieces that you find is that you'll find people who are driven not 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 like not like driven for security, but but driven for their own purposes to excel in that space. Um, and so uh, you need to get away from that. I need to find this hacker. I need to find this, you know, this this white dude that that spent all his time, you know, working on computers, um, that that's not my team. Um, that's not the team I've built. That's not the people I rely on. Um, you know, we've got people with a lot of different backgrounds, some some coming with with no computer security background um, and now are 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 important leaders inside of Talos. So um, you have to find driven, smart, curious people and then give them the space to become what you need them to be. Uh, and you're going to get a whole lot more um, quality output than if you go out looking for something that you think you need. 
Yeah, um, to piggyback off that, uh, what only is referring to is uh, probably the fact that I am not a security researcher by training. Uh, I was a computational astrophysicist and accidentally found myself in security. Uh, so it was a it was a major career change for me. Um, and I think if you were to pull those people that I work with who are brilliant threat hunters, you would see that none of us actually have traditional backgrounds. And really the, the most important factor uh, when building out a successful hunting team is ensuring that you have curious people uh, who, are, who are smart enough to find answers uh, on their own and, and really are able uh, to, to seek uh, knowledge and information because that's more important than any specific technical skill. Uh, even when, um, you know, looking at when my team hires, we're, we're really not looking for anything in particular. We're looking for thought process and and are you a creative problem solver? And so I, I really do think there's no one size fits all background that uh, indicates success of a threat hunting team. Uh, rather, the the overall culture and and um, seeking of knowledge and curiosity is is what indicates a successful program. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Liz, a question has just come in for you. Um, do, uh, do we undertake ethical hacking exercises for our customers? And that is from John on LinkedIn. Uh, certainly we do. Um, and I think we probably have to determine what they mean by ethical hacking. If you mean in terms of red teams and pen testing, that is certainly something that our organization does. Perfect. Um, question for Jerry, uh, and this is from Mira on Facebook. How do I gain more visibility into potential vulnerabilities in our network? Uh, it goes back to, uh, to what most people on this uh, call says. You have to have a good inventory. Uh, software build materials will start playing a bigger, bigger role in that. But um, anything from OS query to uh, your CMDB is the first step uh, that every every organization needs. To go back to the question that was asked to Dave, um, if, if you want to know where to start building a rock solid world class security organization, it's to have the best inventory possible. So, so you're not looking around and having to ask everybody, hey, where does Log4j run on my network? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Ashley, I think people are fascinated by your career um, journey. Uh, Abdullah on LinkedIn, as a threat hunting beginner, uh, what advice and steps do you think that they should follow? And anyone else feel free to come in Good with any career advice. Yeah, I think um, when you're seeking to, to begin and start the learning process, something that's really helpful is um, there are often in security open and online hosted CTFs. Uh, that's a really great way to get a, a good knowledge base. I think most people on this team have probably uh, participated in a CTF at some point. Uh, there's also a, a myriad of conferences and free knowledge sources. Uh, B-Sides is a great conference series that is often free or low cost. Um, there, there's a shocking amount of resources out there where you're able just to use YouTube to, to start to get into things. And um, by, by really seeking that knowledge, I would say that desire to, to kind of cultivate some knowledge from these sources rather than uh, any formal education path is probably uh, the way to go. Perfect. And I um, this book arrived yesterday. I don't know if you can see that, uh, but it's called Navigating the Cybersecurity per uh, Career Path, and it's written by uh, Dave's colleague, um, one of our advisory CISOs, Helen Patton. Um, uh, so I can't wait to dive into that, but that is also a potential source of information there for you. Um, uh, Helen's got a fantastic um, array of advice and has worked a lot with mentors and mentees, so definitely something to check out. Um, but yeah, I think that is all the questions that we have right now. Um, do keep sending them in and we will answer them um, uh, when this event is over. Um, but for now, I just wanted to say a huge, huge thank you to all of our presenters, uh, to Matt, to Dave, to Jerry, to Liz, to Artyom and to Ashley um, for sharing all of your findings and your expertise with us. Um, a website to bookmark for you is uh, this one that's on the screen. Um, it is cisco.com slash go slash critical threats. Um, you will find, uh, shortly you will find today's recording on there. Um, and over the next few days and weeks, as I mentioned, we're going to be adding a lot more content um, to that page to help defenders. So stay tuned to that. 
Um, also, if you if you if you go there now, you'll find last year's report. Uh, and Matt talked about Talos's four year investigation into election security. And also a CISO, Esmond Kane, talked about um, what it's been like to run cybersecurity across a series of hospitals during a pandemic. So another great read. Uh, before I go, uh, if you've got time this afternoon, we are hosting a Cisco Secure virtual party. You can join us and a DJ Z trip. I guess that's Z trip uh, to my colleagues across the ocean, um, who is, I'm told, a critically acclaimed pioneer of the mashup movement. I don't know what that is, um, but I'm intrigued. Uh, and that is taking place at two o'clock Eastern time. And you're very welcome to join us. Um, all the details are on our Cisco Secure social channels. Until next time, thank you for watching. Take care and we'll see you soon.